Welcome to another movie plot. Enjoy the memories and watch out for spoilers. In an alternate take on the classic Arthurian legend, the Dark Mage Mordreds betrayed the alliance with man and laid waste to the world in search of greater power. After slaying the Mage King, he used his staff and summoned an army of oversized elephants that he uses to march on the stronghold of Camelot, casting fire magic from his saddle atop an elephant's back. He's unaware that the great wizard Merlin stole the staff and forged it into the sword Excalibur, which was then bound to the Pendragon bloodline by the Lady of the Lake. King Uther takes up his sword and gives his crown to his younger brother Vortigern to take care of. He rides across the castle's now defunct bridge and sacrifices his horse to leap onto the back of Mordred's mount. It acts as a siege tower for Mordred's dark minions who spill out of the side but are met in bloody combat by Uther's general Bedivere. The king gains access to the dark mage whose defensive pyromancy is countered by the magic of the sword. Walking straight up to him undisturbed, Uther slays Mordred with a single swing of Excalibur and puts an end to his hold over the beasts. The elephants go mad with their newfound freedom throwing the remaining men from their backs, and leaving Uther standing victorious with Mordred's blood-soaked crown. With the world now saved from the mage's wrath, the people of Camelot burn their dead and return to their less-than-mundane lives. After a meeting of the square table, Vortigern appears to be a caring brother but was shown throughout the battle to have a connection with Mordred. That night he enacts his evil backup plan and leads a coup against his brother's kingdom. He takes his wife into a secret cave beneath the castle and rings a beckoning bell, before ritualistically sacrificing her and waiting for something to aid him from the depths. Before his brother's men reach the keep, Uther escapes with his wife and child to an empty dock beneath the castle reserved for his highness. Suddenly a demonic knight rides out and hurls a spear straight through the queen killing a grain in front of her husband and child. Uther takes up Excalibur and battles the entity in a very evenly matched fight, while preventing it from getting to his only child who takes refuge in the boat. We don't see what happens to Uther but the prince is found downriver and raised in London's house of ill repute. As the boy grows older he spends time fighting on the streets and saves every coin he ever earns in a hidden lockbox. He's trained by Kung Fu George out of his dojo and grows up to be a confident strong heir to the throne. However he doesn't know his family name and can only recall brief flashes of that fateful night in Camelot that still haunts Arthur's dreams. His uncle's now the king and conquers foreign lands with his army of black legs as his predecessor Mordred did before him. One day the waters around Camelot docks recede and reveal Uther's sword lodged firmly in a stone. None of the king's black legs are able to remove it no matter how hard they try, so Vortigern returns to the pool beneath Camelot and rings the beckoning bell. He's there to seek counsel from the tentacle-clad sirens that he traded his wife's life to to defeat Uther. The three share the explanation that only when Vortigern kills his escaped nephew Arthur will Excalibur answer to him. He has hundreds of people from all over England brought to Excalibur to test their lineage, and when they're unable to pull it from the stone he brands them and sends them on their way. The evil king's daughter Katya has grown up unaware that her father sacrificed her own mother. Arthur spends his days protecting the women who've raised him, and when one's assaulted by a group of Vikings he retrieves the money she's owed from their king with the help of his friends. After this the Blacklegs raid the house and call on Arthur to answer for his crimes. Their commander Jack's the most reasonable of the soldiers and hears the story in full from Arthur, and further details from Arthur's best friends Wet Stick and Backlack. They've also come searching for one of Uther's former generals Goosefat Bill, who attained the name after constantly slipping his handcuffs. Noticing the bleeding fugitive, Arthur happily gives him up to the Blacklegs unaware of his loyalty to the Pendragon family. Unfortunately the commander tells Arthur that the Vikings he attacked were protected by the king. Therefore the next morning the Blacklegs return for Arthur but Lack assists him in escaping. He runs straight into a group of soldiers who notice Arthur doesn't have a brand and put him onto a ship bound for Camelot. Once there he pushes his way through the long line of testers as he's got more important places to be. He's ordered by General Trigger to put both hands on the hilt and it begins to glow. He's able to pull Excalibur alerting Vortigern and his men who try to attack the rightful king, but the overwhelming power causes him to pass out and be taken their prisoner. Inside his cell Vortigern meets his nephew for the first time and tells him about his father and the power of the sword. His men have found Arthur's savings and have taken the women who raised him as leverage. Mischief John slits one of the lady's throats to make an example of her and the king brings Arthur to the steps of his newly created mage tower. It's identical to the one that powered Mordred from the Blacklands and was destroyed by Merlin. The crowds come to see the true king more than they have the beheading and are made to kneel by their fear of Vortigern's power. At the same time Bedivere is now a tradesman and is met by Merlin's mage associate to help with rescuing the true king. To remove his martyr status, the Earl of Mercia pretends that Arthur's a phony in front of the crowd and won't touch Excalibur because of it. When they're about to behead him the mage summons an eagle to attack the executioner and begins to send the animals wild. The horses fling the soldiers off them and the dogs protect Arthur from further threats. 
Bedivere's rescue team frees Pen Dragon and escape Camelot by leaping off the adjacent cliff into the ocean below, as apparently Blacklegs can't swim. They take him to their hideout where Rubio and Arthur's future Knight of the Round Table Percival introduce him to his father's general. Bedivere then reveals that Goosefat Bill slipped his cuffs again and he gives Arthur a good slap. Wanting to test if Arthur's the real king, they've riled him up enough to take on all three and he draws Excalibur but it doesn't activate. He takes on Bill in single combat easily defeating him but when he double hands the hilt he has visions of his parents killer and passes out again. Because of this the mage suggests that Arthur travel to the Black Lands so that he may learn how to control the sword. Once there he goes from battling with normal snakes to larger than usual bats and rats, to eventually enormous creatures of all sorts and all the while refusing to draw the sword. He's chased to the ruins of the Dark Tower by a pack of wolves who demand of him to use the power of Excalibur. He's able to maintain consciousness this time and is able to remember what he'd once forgotten. That his father Uther battled the Hell Knight to protect him but it was too powerful. Once defeated his father threw his sword into his own back turning him into the stone that protected Excalibur, as the knights revealed to be Vortigern himself having temporarily transformed with the sacrifice of a loved one. The sword in the stone then sank to the bottom of the lake where it remained undisturbed for all those years. Arthur's found the next morning and is brought back to the hideout where his friends from London and generals from Camelot all meet. Despite everything, it isn't until Arthur hears that Jax helped Mischief John destroy his home that he decides to go kill Vortigern. They come up with the elaborate plan to meet with rival barons to join them in their overthrowing of the king. They then sink barges in the port holding up all imports of supplies and free the young slaves promised as exports to the Vikings. After burning the tap house, the king's maid and rebel spy Maggie informs them of his visit to London in three days. Once he gets there the best archer of the bunch waits in a tower 175 yards away with a difficult shot to make. When the king exits his boat the group catch onto it being a decoy since he's just standing around. Vortigan's discovered Maggie's betrayal, but having a personal vendetta against the Earl of Mercia, Bill fires his arrow anyway and kills the general in front of the population. They try to escape but continuously run into small groups of guards throughout the city. Lack stabbed during a skirmish and left behind wounded, while Rubio sustains heavy damage and sacrifices himself charging into the enemy. The remaining group take refuge in George's dojo and all refuse to abandon Arthur when he tells them to leave. The Blacklegs attack the school and fighters begin to protect him as the mage uses a large flock of birds to subdue archers. When Arthur sees the mage captured, he takes the sword in both hands which now slows time and he slices through the entire army with just a couple of swings. With the townspeople seeing the power of their true king, riots break out across the city as the rebels hold up for the night inside a safe house. Lack and his son join them but he's too injured to accompany them in their escape. Using their bloodhounds the Blacklegs track the group down along with Mischief John and the king himself. In front of his own son Blue, Vortigan cuts off Lack's ear and slits his throat leaving Arthur to snatch the boy up and take him with them by river to London. Feeling like he's failed his friends, Arthur throws Excalibur into the lake but is unable to rid himself of it as he pulls it from a puddle in the woods. He's dragged into it by the Lady of the Lake who shows him a vision of the world should Arthur fail his mission. When he returns to the hideout the main group find the rest of the rebels slaughtered at the hands of John. The king's tortured Rubio into divulging the hideout's location and they've taken Lack's son as a hostage. Mischief John's left behind to relay the message that the king wants the sword and Arthur's life in exchange for the boy. Seemingly abiding by the demands, the rightful king has Bedivere deliver the sword to his uncle before turning himself in. The mage uses her eagle to fly a snake to the top of the keep and uses it to sneak inside the castle. The king wastes no time in demanding Arthur's head but when the snake leaps at him he cuts it in half and lodges the sword into a stone pillar. Still unable to remove the sword from the stone, the mage mind controls the giant snake from the Blacklands to breach the keep doors. It kills every Blackleg in the building including John and allowing Arthur to leave unharmed with Excalibur. The rebels free Vortigern's prisoners while Arthur uses the sword to slow time again, and destroys all of the remaining Blackleg resistance in Camelot's courtyard. He's able to dodge arrows and use the sword as a ranged weapon to swipe away dozens at a time. Eventually the smart soldiers surrender to their new king, while Vortigern's shown having escaped the keep and summoning the sirens once again. Already knowing the price he must pay, he kills his own daughter and uses Katya's sacrifice to regain the demonic appearance. At the same time Arthur enters the mage tower and activates it using the sword's power, dragging him to a completely different location where his uncle stands waiting. Fireballs blast Arthur off his feet and unlike his father he's overpowered by Vortigern in every aspect of the fight. As he lays defeated and about to be slain, Arthur has a vision of his father's death and this time catches the sword. Uther bequeaths onto him Excalibur allowing Arthur to regain consciousness and rises back up. While he was in prison Vortigan asked Arthur what drove him to greatness despite never knowing who his father was. Unable to answer him at the time, 
Arthur now knows that it was his uncle's betrayal and they continue to fight. This time Arthur deflects the fireballs and is too fast for the knight to land a strike, and after disarming his weapons Arthur impales his uncle with Excalibur straight through the torso. The Hell Knight turns back into the measly human and dies with Arthur thanking him for the motivation. Now able to use the power of the sword with a single hand, Arthur brings Vortigen's tower down as Merlin did to Mordred sending it crumbling to the earth. Just like the first time the victors burn their dead on pyres outside Camelot. The King of England tries to cut ties with the Vikings telling them that they shall no longer supply them with young slaves. But seeing the power that Arthur wields the Northern Lord wisely aligns himself with his new king. Arthur then constructs a round table for equality during meetings as his knights all stand around debating what it could be. With George thinking the table may be a dance floor. Sir Bedivere's task with knighting Sir George, then Sir Tristan, then Sir Percival as the first members of the Knights of the Round Table. Arthur has Sir William do the honors of knighting the king himself before the crowning of the king takes place. The whole of Camelot watches on as Arthur is presented with his crown and sword of power. The mage watches over him as Merlin did with his father before him, and as he raises Excalibur above his head all of Camelot cheers for King Arthur. And the movie ends. So you made it. I appreciate your time. I couldn't have done it without you. Tell your mother I said thanks.